And good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining our lecture today. Um, the lecture is going to be um, with Rayushan. And um, so Rayushan Marsad is a Zen teacher and a Dharma heir of the late John Thedo Luri, founder of the Zen Mountain Monastery, where Rayushan served as abbot for over five years through January of 2015. Soon after leaving the monastery, Ryushin began leading meditation workshops for the cancer community and teaching independently. Ryushin received a BA degree of anthropology from Yale University, a medical degree from Albany Medical College, and served as a physician in the US Navy before entering full-time residential training at the monastery in 1992. And we're super happy he's here with us. And I'd like to introduce you to Ryushin Marshaj. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Afrasi. Um, good afternoon. Um, some familiar faces. Um, oh, I see. Somebody was clapping with an emoji. I'm, I'm still shocked when those things appear. I'm not quite sure what 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 that all means and what's going on. But first, um, uh, acknowledgement to uh, Red Door. Ifrasi, thank you. And uh, to Joe Royola, who kind of uh, is the person behind the scenes organizing some of these events and very much uh, instrumental in my making contact with all of you. Um, so thank you. Also, um, apologizing for the necessity to switch the schedule. This lecture was, this gathering, this event was scheduled for two weeks ago. And um, my schedule gets easily disrupted based on just needs of people that I work with and kind of a multiplicity of responsibilities that I have. So, so sorry if there's any inconvenience that that caused to you. Um, and um, kind of, you know, stepping right into what, what it is that um, I want to share with you when I come up with these themes or topics or ways of entering um, what is reflections on the nature of you know, our human challenge, but also the possibilities that come with it, all of them, at least from the tradition that I come with, being informed by our relationship, my relationship to my mind, to my awareness. Um, the teachings are very simple. They really are pointing to something so basic, so fundamentally available to all of us, that by the very nature of that simplicity, there's almost an infinite number of ways that you can approach both how you speak to the problem, but also how you then address the possibility of resolving it, you know. And so when I come up with these titles or these entry points, I do them, you know, a few months or maybe even years in the past. And then it never ceases to amaze me how when I come back around and in this case, meet with you and share the reflections that I will, when I look at the title, Ease Amidst Disease, it surprises me how much there is just in that, um, that in those few words, ease within this ease, is a summation of the challenge that we're all facing. So, you know, what I'll do with you is once again, really not do anything different that I haven't been doing for the last five or six years or however long we've been in this relationship with Red Door and these reflections, these talks, these experiences on meditation. But I'll talk, I'll talk for um, maybe 20, 25 minutes, and then um, then we'll go into meditation and I'll guide you into the place of practice, which is ultimately the most important part of what we're doing. Um, and do that maybe for 15 minutes or so, and then there will be a little bit of time in the, af in the aftermath to, um, to engage in any conversations, any question and answers that may be helpful to you both in terms of understanding 
and again, but more importantly, in terms of being maybe implementing um, the practices of meditation in your own life. So, and we have about an hour, plus minus, if it overflows into more than an hour, that's okay with me. And obviously you're free to go at any time. Um, ease within disease. The the beginning is the disease, you know, the the acknowledgement of the fact that we, these very sensitive beings, um, these human beings, um, are extremely susceptible by the very nature of how we are put together neurologically, sensibly, emotionally, that we are subject, we are targets for pain, for painful experiences across the full spectrum of our being. So our bodies hurt uh, the way we're wired. If something impinges on our nervous system, it hurts. It gives us a signal that something is going on that's not right, that may be harmful, that may be uh, threatening to our life and to our well-being or to our continuity, if you will, of our kind of biological imperative. But we're also extremely susceptible on a um, psychological level. So insults to our self-identity uh, continuously abound. Somebody can look at us the wrong way and we'll hurt, we'll be afraid. Um, our hearts can be broken in our capacity to feel, to become attached to people, to certain ways of being. Once again, we create a target for impermanence, for changeability, for unpredictability of the world to create incredible sometimes pain, pain that literally can kill us. So, so we are these walking targets, if you will, for impermanence. So we're living in a state of maybe happiness, certain level of equilibrium or balance, or maybe even pleasure and joy and happiness in our life if the circumstances are right. But then the moment those circumstances shift in some specific direction, the whole thing can collapse overnight. And the sense of well-being, the sense of uh, wholeness, the sense of comfort can really disappear in an instant. And that's the second layer of the discomfort or disease that we feel is that we know that. That even when things are okay, we know that at any moment that could change. And that is not a comfortable feeling. We try to ignore that dimension of the human project, if you will, of our personal project. So we try to amass and create circumstances where we feel okay with ourselves, be it on a personal level with partners, people who give us the confirmation of our well-being or our love. We do it on a materialistic level by accumulating goods, money, and trying to establish security into the future. We do it on psychological level by creating narratives and meaningful systems that hold us in place. We do it on a spiritual level, a religious level, by creating relationship with divine beings or realms beyond this life or intermediaries who will somehow hold us together. So that's the one project. But then the second project is to forget is literally to ignore, to distract ourselves, to numb ourselves to the fact that at an instant, the whole thing can collapse. So the threats are dual. They're very much situational, circumstantial, but they're also deeply existential. So that's our human disease. And obviously, for those of us who have gotten sick, those of us who are looking face-to-face -face directly into the fact, undeniable fact of our mortality, the mortality of those that we love, it's not a simple place to navigate. And we know that, that we know that, that there is, that we are a very interesting condition of the universe, that the universe was brilliant in 
delivering this package called the humanity and then your unique expression of it. But at the same time, there's a price that we're paying or that the, not necessarily the price that we're paying, but the challenge that we're facing all the time. This will not go away. We can imagine or try to imagine immortality or we try to imagine some guaranteed condition that is going to offer us this unperturbable, undeniable happiness. In some ways, the notion of heaven represents that, um, that belief, fantasy, hope, whatever it is that somehow counteracts that susceptibility and vulnerability that we feel. But even if we believe in heaven, that still doesn't take away the challenge of how to navigate this very mortal, very earthy, very ordinary life that may be filled with fear and pain and discomfort. That's the dis-ease. That's what in the Dharma and Buddhism we refer to this fact of undeniable suffering, that we suffer in this kind of a state of existential angst, if you will. And then Buddhism comes along and also says, well, guess what? That's absolutely true. And from the perspective of the Dharma, of Buddhism, we know the Dharma practitioners, through your own experience, you very quickly realize that you really have to shift your orientation from imagining that there will be a place of deliverance, that there will be some set of conditions that will guarantee this perpetual, permanent assurance that everything is okay. Buddhism acknowledges right from the beginning, that's impossible. That's not the right strategy to try to solve the human problem, your problem, my problem. That we need to ask ourselves a very different question, which is the question of this title, of this talk. Is it possible that within the factuality of the human condition, the fact that we are impermanent, that we are mortal, that we have a fin finite amount of time on this earth, that we are subject to pain, that we're su we are subject to brokenness, broken-heartedness, broken-mindedness, broken body, that with all of those things in place, not denying that, not trying to attenuate that, not trying to diminish that, as a matter of fact, seeing that as clearly as we can, is it possible that within the conditions of human existence, the condition of this life, we can actually be at ease with all of it? And the answer from the Dharma, from the Buddhist perspective, is absolutely yes. That that's the only thing that Buddhism is actually interested in. It's not that Buddhism isn't subject of exactly the same relationship that we develop with everything else in our life of deliverance of somehow being transcendent into some other form of being we will do that we can't help it that's the human one of the number one human strategies to kind of get beyond the disease beyond our suffering beyond our limitations that the answer is somewhere else in some other arrangement of conditions, ordinary, extraordinary, non-ordinary, divine, whatnot, that that's where the problem, that's where the solution is. Buddhism is saying, no, the solution is right here, right smack in the middle, right at the center of that discomfort. And what we need to do is not change those circumstances, not try to adjust them, ignore them, diminish them, eliminate them. No, what we need to do is learn how to use our minds and our hearts and our bodies differently. We need to develop a different attitude and then through practice, a different way of being, of learning how to return, return to a certain quality of experience which is always available to us regardless of the circumstances. And when we actually find that sense of stability, clarity, 
open-heartedness, openness, non-judgmentality about the nature of our experience, something starts to happen that alters, completely alters the nature of our relationship and in that the nature of the experience of our disease. Suddenly disease is not a problem because we can recognize that within whatever those conditions are, including the conditions of pain, including the conditions of losing control, including the condition of dying and death itself, where there's absolutely the possibility of ease within that. We will still be in pain. We will still grow old. We will still lose control. We will still go through the process of dying and death. That's not going to change. What's going to change is literally how we are within all of that. And that sounds like a pretty amazing promise. Never mind promise. You know, the crazy thing about the Dharma is that it guarantees that. It absolutely says this is not a chance. This is not something that is somehow limited to the special few. No, everybody who has a mind, everybody who has awareness, everybody who feels, everybody who can maintain a sense of presence and awareness and openness to their experience can practice that, verify that, and within that, find that ease. And that's the practice of meditation. At a certain point, that quality of mind, once it is invited, recognized, and brought online, it starts to penetrate all of the aspects of our life. But to enter that, we have to remove ourselves from the conditioned patterns of reactivity, of impulsivity, of perpetuating this kind of a promise of becoming, of chasing continuously after something, that special something, that magic bullet, that promise, or whatever it is that we're expecting will happen if the right things come out just right. So meditation is a step inward, is a step that takes us ever closer to that place of unperturbability, of inherent stillness, inherent openness, inherent kindness that we have for ourselves and this world within us. Where discrimination is replaced by equanimity, when pursuit of knowledge is replaced by open-hearted wisdom, where the sense of measurement and trying to somehow discern how much we can give or not is replaced by unlimited compassion of our being. And when that is online, when that comes completely online for each one of us, we truly can live a life of ease, not just within our own struggles or the things that will show up, but we can bring that attitude to everybody else. So I can communicate your ease, or I can point that out, or I can create an atmosphere, an environment by how I am with myself that will absolutely affect how you're going to be relating to whatever it is that you're relating to. From the perspective that we bring when the mind is that clear, there are no problems, there are just opportunities. Opportunities to wake up to the fact that that thing I call the problem, the barrier, is absolutely the only thing that can be manifesting right now that confirms for me my capacity to be free precisely where before it seemed that this was somehow constrained. And that's not because I have removed the constraint. It's because I have shifted how I am resting, how I am perceiving, how I am with that phenomenon, with that quality of experience. So there is, there is a possibility of unconditional ease. There is a possibility of unconditional delight, freedom, amidst everything that your life is going to present you with. And again, acknowledging, I understand that we're speaking 
for many of you with realities that are frightening, painful, and that's why teachings like this are very, very important. Everything that I said, just put aside, because remember that what I am saying is a kind of a fundamental approach. Sometimes people confuse that for saying, well, I don't have to then take an aspirin when I have a headache. No, absolutely, take the aspirin for the headache. It just recognize that that approach will never give you that peace of mind that we're addressing by fundamentally taking care of that tendency to be continuously imagining that there's going to be that state that's going to somehow remove me from being a target to impermanence. So the conventional approach to the things that we are facing remains, and it actually kind of sharpens the focus of what it is that we need in order to feel less pain, to diminish our anxiety if need be. But those interventions, if you will, will not take care of the fact that impermanence is always waiting just around the corner, and it's going to show up again and again and again and again. So how does meditation interface with that? Well, you know, the meditation, when it's ripe, what is it that we're doing? We're sitting still. We're sitting still and that stillness acknowledges our acceptance, radical acceptance that whatever is going to manifest during the 30 minutes or 15 minutes or an hour that we'll be sitting still, that we are committed to remaining in a relationship of workability. So I'm going to assume a posture of stillness and let my body, my heart, my mind, circumstances to manifest themselves as thoughts, as feelings, as emotions, as bodily sensations, as sounds around me, as smells, possibly certain vistas. And I'm not going to be manipulating that. I will become an open container in an uncensored fashion, not trying to manipulate that experience in any way whatsoever. I will simply remain an open screen, an open container, an open stage on which the reality of my subjective experience can play itself out. And I will identify, I will rest with that quality of awareness, being accepting, non-judgmental, maintaining equanimity and care with respect to everything and anything that moves through my mind as my experience. So if a painful thought arrives, I have year to live. That's a thought that moves across the screen of my mind and the screen of my mind just lets it be. In face of a thought that is painful, there is a part of the experience which isn't painful. It's just seeing, it. it's feeling that thought as that reality moving through my mind. If you're sitting and there's suddenly a pang of pain in your heart, Again, it's just that. Something is happening, some contraction, some closure, some hesitation, some doubt, some forgiveness that's moving through. And again, it may be painful, it may be releasing from the perspective of the screen of the mind. It's just a feeling. It's just a sensation. There is something within the experience which isn't painful, which isn't joyful. It's just aware. It's just present. It's unmitigatingly available, but nothing else. It's like an embrace of a mother, perfectly loving, unconditionally loving mother who's holding an infant in her hands. And no matter if the infant is throwing a tantrum, has just threw up all over her, 
or is giggling and smiling, she's just holding that child with complete openness and unconditional acceptance. That's the ease that we're capable of. And in some ways, it's actually deeper than mother's unconditional love. Because it's accepting of literally anything and everything that your universe presents you with. Now, having said that, yeah, we start small. You know, that's a grand vision. And why meditation is a practice is because we, we need to literally learn to do this. We need to identify and recognize first how we don't do that, how we continuously collapse and judge and afraid of our thoughts, of our feelings, of the pain, of the joy, how much preferential treatment we're giving to everything that we're experiencing, continuously categorizing, compartmentalizing, oh, this is good, this is bad. I want this and not that. And in that continuous maelstrom of having to choose, we continuously get tangled up. And imagine that if we get everything right, it's going to be right. And if we're going to somehow be stuck with the wrong, it's wrong. And remember, what we're saying is that, no, amidst sadness, there is something in your experience that isn't sad. Amidst happiness, there is something in your experience which isn't happy. And meditation reveals that, reveals that quality of mind, which is, isn't anything special. It's not even something you're creating. It's something, it's not that you're discovering it. You're recovering it. So let's do that. You know, this is, you know, kind of the preview of how to bring ourselves to the place where we can sit together and don't underestimate the power of that, that for the next 15 minutes, we will sit together supporting each other and verifying each other in that practice of openness. So I'll be supporting you by being accepting at the distance with everything that you're going to be going through. You're going to be doing that for me. But to begin with, we'll be doing that for ourselves. So I'll sit with my subjectivity, with my current confusion, uncertainties that I'm facing in my life, with the dis-ease that I'm experiencing. And what I'll be trying to do in that stillness of the mind is to be okay with that. There is a reason for it. But rather than trying to work on the reason, the only thing I'll be doing is remaining a certain in a certain posture, certain attitude, certain openness, definitely physical stillness, not rigid, relaxed, spacious, open, allowing. Allowing for my life, all of my life to be welcome and to move through and show itself up so I can acknowledge it and let it pass through. Resting in that awareness. So take, take a posture that's comfortable, nothing esoteric, just find a place where you can sit comfortably, cross-legged in a chair. If you need to lean into a back of the chair, all fine, but literally situate yourself into your body, maintaining as much ease, relaxation, openness as you can. And literally nothing special. You don't have to do anything with your hands. But a certain level of dignity, straightness, openness of heart, relaxation, letting the eyes rest so you're not looking around. So the stillness is also stillness of movement. You don't want to be chasing, pursuing any specific thing that will be happening. And then just for a moment or two, you know, connect with your breath just feel feel the action of your breath and how that breath informs the feeling of your body the state of presence feel the gravity grounding you feel the space around you feel the space within you 
feel the openness of this experience amidst everything that you're experiencing. And then after you've taken two or three breaths and paying attention to the breaths, release even the breath. And just remain awake. Remain present to anything and everything that manifests as your experience. No preference, no blocking it, not avoiding it. The simple mantra is let it in, let it be, let it go. You're a conduit of your subjectivity. You're not a parking place where reality rests, your flow. And so we'll do that for 15 minutes and I'll time the period so you may hear, you know, a bell or three bells to be exact. Three bells always mark the beginning of the meditation period and then two bells mark the end. So here we go.
You got it? Yeah. Okay. That worked earlier.
Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, okay, so we have, you know, um, 10, 15 minutes to come back to anything that um, you've experienced. That's the most important um, aspect of all of this, is to what degree um, you understand this. It is it's a little bit of a radical way of looking at, at reality, although there's a beautiful logic there. But everything that I shared with you isn't so much about, you know, is this how it is? It's more of an invitation. The reason why we present this the way I present it is to just pique your curiosity and then get you to the place where you can look at this yourself and see for yourself how this works or doesn't work, where the questions are where the questions are responded to. Um, <laughs> this morning, I, I send this daily, daily kind of a little bit of a, what I call an inspiration or an irritant, depending how you look at it. And I think uh, I mean, this one, this morning's one went as, you know, as much as we see what as a question, also see it as the answer. What? <laughs> what is also an answer. Anyway, um, anything that comes across your mind, anything that you've experienced, anything that you wanted to share or ask about, uh, please just feel free to jump in and help each other. Hello, Eileen. Good to see you. Haven't been been, been too long. <laughs> <laughs> Good to see you. I'm always I'm surprised by the amount of movement and st mm -hmm. stillness. Mm -hmm. that's, I guess that's all I have to say for now. Yeah. But, uh, no, no, no. I mean, beautiful. Stay with it. It's, you know, movement and stillness. I mean... Like, yeah, I, I, it's, I, I, it's like you, you feel things flowing inside even yeah. though you're still. Good. That's the I, point. <laughs> I mean, no, seriously, there is only movement. There's only impermanence. When I say you are flow, that's all we are. We are a current. We are a stream. We are a continuously vibrating field. We don't even have the words for what it is. And it just happens that within that field, something about the nature of the human karma we create this this emergent quality shows up where we think oh there is something static and stable which i'm going to call ryushin and that's the problem because the field reminds nothing but movement nothing but change and meditation in a very skillful way says okay be still and observe what's starting to happen and in that stillness you notice precisely what you've noticed Except that I'll guarantee you that if you keep looking, you'll be shocked how much movement there is and ultimately that there is movement and nothing else. So this illusion that there is something fixed in that movement, like you, the observer, you, some stable reference system, that's an illusion. You will see that that too is just a construct that's continuously coming together, falling apart, coming together. And guess what? Nothing bad happens when you start seeing that. If anything, what starts to happen is that you gain the sense of ease and joy and delight because you're not clenching to this pattern that I call the self, that I call myself, that is somehow stable, that's going to, I don't know, outlast this. So congratulations. I mean, that's it. If you really have seen thoroughly what you just said, you're completely enlightened. Relax. <laughs> I'm, listen, I'm joking and I'm not joking. You understand, Eileen. You know me well enough that when I say stuff like that, I mean it. That when we genuinely see into the nature of radical impermanence and that we see that the very seeing is radical impermanence, and that the sense of me being somehow a, a fixed part of the picture is nothing but radical impermanence, I am free. 
I have become freedom itself. And I'm in a position to live this life with complete sense of connectivity, presence, relationality, not being afraid of something that we don't need to be afraid of. So are you going to say something? I apologize. Oh, no, I, I just, I get that from taking care of dogs. If you, like, what are they? Oh, I remember. They're all the time. I'm taking yeah. care of the best one right now. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, it's like there's something going on with them, but not stressful that they just can sit still. Yeah. But like they're doing something. So it's like I, I I feel like I'm sort of getting it from them. Oh, they're big friends for <laughs> me anyway, because they do the reminder that very likely they're operating within their reality without fear. It's not that if the car is coming by, they won't going to jump out. Or if you raise your hand, they're not going to yell because they're afraid. But that's a very different experience. They're very likely our flow. And from within their perspective, there is. There is no, they're not sticking on, you know, oh, Spot is going for a walk. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'll share this story. It's a silly story. But, you know, I had this wonderful Springer Spaniel for like 17 years of my life. <laughs> And, you know, we were close and I thought for a while that I was infecting him with my human predisposition to structuring myself into a sense of self because there were moments where he would start looking out the window the way philosophers do. And it was like, holy shit, like I am somehow ruining his life for him <laughs> by modeling, you know, a sense of self. It worked out okay. She was fine. Anyway, thanks for sharing. Thank you. Good to yeah. see you. Good to see you. Anybody else? Okay, so let, let it go. That was kind of a nice way, nice way to close the discussion, Eileen, once again on target. And uh, I'll turn it back to you, yeah, Fresi, if uh, there's anything you or Joe need to say about future events or anything like that, please. Please do, and thank you. Thank you for making this thank possible. Thank you. Thank you all for joining. Joe, would mm -hmm. you like to say anything? Sure, uh, just a quick moment. Uh, thank you, <laughs> Ryu, and I've been trying to be a Buddha behind behind the wheel here. Um, uh, so I'm glad I was able to um, to to uh, to join, and I'll just uh, remind everyone here uh, that uh, there's an opportunity to practice weekly in the workshop led on Mondays um, by Susan, who is here, and she leads a weekly group uh, called Meditation for Radical Change, which meets every Monday at, at, at 2.30. And of course, you're all welcome to that. And Susan, I don't know if you want to add anything, but um, yeah, thank you all for being here. Thank you so much, Ryushin. Thank you all for joining. I appreciate and it. Have a lovely weekend. Thank you. Thank you, all of you. You're very welcome. Great being with you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.